الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وخاتم النبيين وسيد المرسلين أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين ولعن الله الدائم على عدائهم أجمعين من ليلتنا هذه إلى قيام يوم الدين السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين Respected elders and brothers and sisters in Islam and Iman The topic that we've been covering in these nights has been regarding the idol of the self. Islam has taught us a means, a path from moving from the self to Allah Ta'ala. And that path is the path of Tawheed. And it's important for us to understand how in our times, in our society, this Self that we have becomes an idol that we're called to worship. Tonight I want to talk about one of the aspects of self-worship which has to do with a type of individualism where we start to think that the only thing that matters in this world is me. And everyone else becomes somebody who is of second importance. One of the father figures for such an ideology can be found in the Qur'an. His name is Fir'aun. Fir'aun was shown miracle after miracle. Example after example that Allah is Akbar. That Allah is the source of his blessings. Allah is his Rabb. Allah is the one who's provided for him. But he insisted on taking a stand against Allah until the Qur'an describes to us to what level he had become somebody who worshipped himself and disregarded everyone else around him. So in Surah Al-Zukhruf, Surah number 43, verse 51, Allah says, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem. Allah quotes Fir'aun as saying, Ya qawmi, alaysa li mulkum misr wa hadihil anharu tajri min tahti afala tubsirun. O my people, isn't it the case that I own Egypt, it's all mine? I'm the one who's it's sort of in my possession. And even these very rivers that are passing beneath you, the rivers were the source of all their livelihood at that time. I'm the one who owns them. And then he goes on to say, Am ana khayrun min hadha alladhi huwa mahin wa la yakadu yabin, 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 meaning that am I better or this one, this, you know, this thing, like this man, this thing who is lowly and he can barely even articulate himself. Now, imagine he's in a position here where, you know, a, a, a logical person, somebody who is really trying to convince his people, right? he would use some sort of logical argument to convince them. But you see here, the only response that he has has to do with himself. The only thing he can talk about is me and my situation, what I own and how much I am better than others. Now, this attitude of looking at oneself as being the most important thing and not considering the society as a whole. Salu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Is a type of 
thinking that you can find in our society as well. Many people become obsessed with themselves and their only main project of their lives is themselves. If they have a concern for others, it's sort of a passing concern. Once in a while, you know, they'll feel like, okay, let me give some charity or let me do some random acts of goodness. Let me go and put in my time at the soup kitchen. But most of their concern and most of their thoughts and most of their time is spent on themselves and maybe on their families. We live in a very individualistic society in that way. Now what I'd like to do tonight is to look at this question about what is the Islamic perspective on it and how important is it for us to understand the role of society in Islam. Because what I'm going to be leading up to is one of the main reasons why the return of the Imam of our time has been delayed. And I'm going to show, inshallah, how this is related to the individualism that has pervaded our society. So when you go to the Qur'an, Allah Ta'ala says in <clears throat> Surah Al-Ma'idah, verse number 105, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانُ الرَّجِيمِ يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا عَلَيْكُمْ أَنفُسَكُمْ لَا يَضُرُّكُمْ مَنْ ضَلَّ إِذَا هَتَدَيْتُمْ O oh, you who believe, you have to take care of yourselves. Somebody who is misguided is not going to harm you if you are somebody who is guided. Now, a question for you. Based on that verse, what do you think? Is Islam emphasizing the individual? Or is Islam emphasizing the society as a whole? Allah says that you have to take care of yourself. The person who is misguided, you don't have to worry about him if you're the somebody who's guided. If that were the only verse in the Quran, maybe we would think that it's okay to be and have an individualistic approach. Meaning I just kind of care about myself, I don't really worry about others. But it's not the only verse. We have other verses, for example, if we look at um, Surah Al-Hadid, um, Surah number 57, verse number 25, Allah says, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ لَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا رُسُّلَنَا بِالْبَيِّنَاتِ وَأَنزَلْنَا مَعَهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْمِيزَانِ We have sent the prophets, the messengers, with clear evidences, you know, like the Qur'an, like the books before them, miracles. وَأَنزَلْنَا مَعَهُمُ الْكِتَابَ We sent the, the book, وَالْمِيزَانِ We sent um, a scale by which people may measure what's right and what's wrong. What was the whole reason for God sending the prophets? Was it just so that people can get into heaven when they die? Was it just so that they would know how to do their wudu and their takbir and do their prayers? nasu bil qist. The whole purpose why Allah sent all those prophets and the books and all the struggle that they took to convey that message to us was for a purpose Allah wanted the people to establish justice. So when we put these together, what we understand is that there are at least one verse, and there's other verses which talk about the importance of the self, and there are verses which talk about the importance of the society, and in particular, a just society. Now how can we put these two together? According to um, the commentators, and especially I'm referring to the teachings of Ayatollah Khamenei on this topic because he's done a very wonderful job of weaving all these verses together. He says that what these type of verses tell us is that there are two journeys that Allah wants us to take in our lives. And maybe this is a new perspective that we haven't heard before, but it's a very um, unique and uh, a very clear way of looking at what is our duty. There's two journeys we want to take. We have responsibilities to undertake two journeys. One of them is a journey of the self. Ya ayuhal insan, innaka kadihun ila rabbika kadhan fa mulaqi. Surah al Inshiqa. Oh, oh, human being, you are on a journey, and it's a laborious journey, it's a hard trek, but the end of it is to meet your Lord. And when you meet your Lord, you're going to be asked about how those blessings that you were given were used. That's a personal journey. And it's a journey from the self to God. It's a journey from the self to Tawheed. It's a journey from Asfal al-Safideen, meaning the lowest of the low, to A'al al aliyin meaning the highest of the high. It's a journey towards perfection. And everyone is tasked to go on that journey. 
But there's another journey as well, which is a journey that we need to take collectively as a society. And that's a journey towards the realization of the just society. And we are tasked with both of them. And both of them are necessary in order, like they both depend on each other. It's not possible for somebody to focus on one of them and to ignore the other one. I'll give you an example. We have many people in history who have had a lot of focus on personal aspects of worship. Up until today, if you go and say, where would you find like the best masajid and the most you know, uh, widely attended gatherings in the mosques, you know, the most sort of sophisticated sort of buildings, and they even have AC there as well too, right? Like Saudi Arabia, right? And those type of countries. Okay, they're really good at that type of thing, right? They have beautiful buildings, they have Quran competitions, they have all these things going on. But you see that they have no problem when it comes to trampling on human rights. It's something which is totally okay with them. They have no issue with it whatsoever. So they might, in a very superficial, very, very you know, uh, unscientific, very unacademic way, they might have succeeded when it comes to the personal aspect, but not really. But when it comes to this aspect, they're completely failing. And their result is they're going to be failures. Now, it's the same way, on the other hand, if somebody doesn't have the personal growth, then they're not going to be effective in the society as well. And one of the examples that's been given in this regard is the Battle of Uhud. You know, the Battle of Uhud um, was a battle where the Muslims were not victorious. Maybe you could even say that they lost the battle, but they weren't victorious at least. They suffered great losses. This was after they had been incredibly successful against all odds in the Battle of Badr. Why is it that they failed even though they were Muslims, they had Iman, they were with the Prophet, they were definitely fighting for Haq, not for Batil? Allah tells us in the Quran, in Surah, Al- Surah Ali Imran, verse number 155, Inna ladina tawallaw minkum yawmal taqal jam'an innama istazallahum ash-shaytanu bi ba'di ma kasabu. Indeed, those who um, turned away, they fled the scene on the day in which the two parties met. The reason why they did that was because the shaytan caused them to slip. Why? On account of some things that they had done. Some acts that they had committed, some sins they had committed prevented them from actually being successful. You all know the story from the Quran where Talut had an army and he was going to, going to fight Jalut, Goliath, the big tyrant, you know, the giant. And Talut has to test his people, make sure that they're for the right reason. So he says, you know, it's a hot day, you know, like people are uncomfortable and there's a river. And he says, you can't drink from the river or if you want to just drink like one handful, but that's it. And it was a major test for the people. What happens then? Those people who drink from the river, they don't have that motivation to make it to the final place. They don't have the honor of participating in that battle. Those who refrain from it, those are the ones who actually have that motivation and eventually Allah gives them that victory. Meaning what? Meaning like these examples, we have to really ponder upon them. Right? Because what we're going to be leading to soon is this kind of uh, a little bit of introspection as to what is the plight of our society. Why is it that our imam is in ghaybah? These type of stories, they remind us that victory is not something which necessarily requires great numbers of people. Victory is not something which necessarily requires great weapons of mass destruction. But what we do know is that victory requires a commitment to the personal journey of the people who are involved in striving for that victory. So that's what we see time and time again in the examples of the Qur'an, in the examples in history. So, if somebody wants to achieve a personal goal of success, right, they have to fulfill the responsibilities of the society. And if they want to achieve success in the society, they have to fulfill their responsibilities to their personal growth as well. Both of them are important. Now, what is the goal for the society? We talked about the goal for the, the individual. What is, how is it that Allah wants it to be? You know, when we talk about this just society, 
What, kind of, what are the features of this society? Some of the verses in the Quran which describe something about it can be found in Surah Al-Ma'idah. And because, because these verses are so key, I would like to read them out and give some explanation from them. Again, this is from the teachings of Ayatollah Khamenei regarding these verses. If you can help me with the salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. First of all, what kind of people are the ones who would uphold this ideal society? Okay, Allah says, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem, verse 54, Surah Al-Ma'idah, Ya ayuha alladhina amanu, man yartadda minkum an dinihi, fasawfa ya'ati allahu bi qawmin, yuhibbuhum wa yuhibbunahu, adhillatin ala al-mu'minin, a'izzatin ala al-kafirin, yujahiduna fi sabili allahi, wa la yakhafuna lawma talaim, thalika fadru Allah yu'tihi man yasha, wallahu wasir alim. Oh, you who believe, if... People, if there are amongst you, people are going to turn away from their religion. They're not going to fulfill the goals of what the religion is there for. What is the goal? We read in that verse, to establish a just society. If they're not going to do it, Allah says that He's going to bring a people who are going to do it. What is their qualities? Well, number one is Allah loves them and they love Allah. They are extremely humble towards the mu'mineen. They are extremely... Um, harsh when it comes to the kafirin, meaning those people who are uh, sworn enemies of truth and justice. Not the people who are, you know, the kafirin here doesn't mean like the people who are ignorant, but those who actually have taken a stance and they are the enemies. Uh, they strive in the path of God and they do not fear if anybody calls them out and tells them that you're doing something wrong. They know what they have to do. Um, that is the bounty of Allah. He gives to whom He pleases, and, well, and Allah is. Allah is expansive, He is knowledgeable. Now, brothers and sisters, um, this society is not a society which will be set up by people who are just ordinary in their qualities. They have certain qualities, and we mentioned you know, five or so of these qualities about loving God, God loves them, they have a relationship with the believers, they have a certain stance against the kafirin, um, and so on. Okay, now, that's about the people who are involved, but every society has to have a leader, right? You can't be successful in any effort, when it, any social or political effort unless you have a leader. Okay, so what is the, and who is the leader of that society? So Allah says in the next verse, um, verse number 55, إِنَّمَا وَلِيُّكُمُ Allah. Indeed, your wali is Allah. Okay, if you want to know who the center and who the leader and who the master is of this incredibly you know, super important project which is the goal of all the prophets and which is the goal of you as collectively as a people. The goal is to establish a society where the leader of it is Allah. But we know that um, the way that Allah works is that He always has a representative. So who is going to be God's representative? وَرَسُولُهُ Okay, His messenger. Okay, so the messenger definitely is going to be the center of that society, that just society. But what happens when the messenger passes away? Because this is a long-term project, right? All the prophets have been working towards it. So then, وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا الَّذِينَ يُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَاةَ وَيُؤْتُونَ الزَّكَاةَ وَهُمْ رَاكِعُونَ Those who believe and those who establish the prayers and gives the zakah and they are the ones who are in the state of ruku. Now we all know, and this is something which is reported unanimously in the Shia Tafasir, and it's something which is acknowledged by many of the Sunni Tafasir as well, that the sole individual that was, this reverse was revealed regarding is none other than Amir al muminin Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. Now, have you ever wondered, brothers and sisters, that couldn't Allah made, have it made it easier just by kind of saying, wa rasuluhu wa Ali ibn Abi Talib? He could have, right? Why? What is the reason? What is the wisdom behind Allah giving the characteristics of the successor of the Prophet. Have you ever thought about that? Ayatollah Khamenei said very, something very interesting. He says that Allah did not just want us to know who the person is, but He wanted us to know on what basis does He merit being the wali, being the center point, being the leader. It's because He's the one who most perfectly upholds these qualities. He's the one who establishes prayer. He's the one who, because he's the one himself, is the, the closest connected to God. 
And he's the one who can establish the remembrance of God throughout the land. He's the one who establishes justice. He gives zakah because he's the one who has the most pain for the orphans and for um, the needy. And no one will go turned away from, you know, no one will be turned away from the doorstep of Amir al in the house of Ali alayhi salam. And he's somebody who has that humility as well. He has that, even when he's engaged in his worship of Allah, he has that sense of his social responsibility. Both of them are important for him. Those criteria are important. Why? Because we have to understand that Amir al-Mu'mini was chosen for a specific reason. And the people who come after him also must fulfill the same qualities. They have to have the same things as well. Otherwise, what happens is that you have people who come along in the future, they say that we accept Amir al-Mu'mineen as the wali, but we also accept Harun al-Rashid as the wali, Ma'amun al-Rashid as the wali. Why? Because, well, after all, you know, he called himself wali al muslimin He's the one who's the leader at that time. You see, somebody who reads the Quran, they say that, no, wait a minute, there's some criteria that are given here for who makes a valid leader. And so we know that after Imam al-Islam, we had all the Imams after him. But what comes after that, brothers and sisters? What happens when the Imam goes in Ghaiba? There were two extremely important descriptions given here. Number one, of the people who are going to be part of establishing this ultimate government of wilaya, and I'm using wilaya because that's the word that Allah uses here in these verses. There are the, there's the descriptions of the people, and there's a description of the leader as well too. What kind of leader it has to be. Unfortunately, one of the huge mistakes that the Shia community has made since the time of the Ghaiba is that they sort of looked at this and they said that, okay, now that the Imam is not accessible to us, let's sort of put all this other stuff aside as well too. And then what happens is the leaders become the type of leaders that you see today. And we start to imagine that, well, this is what you know, a political leader is about. And then sometimes then we, when we take a bad taste towards politics altogether because we see the type of people who are the politicians. Brothers and sisters, the Quran tells us that, no, leaders have certain qualities in Islam. The society that we need to establish, the certain qualities we need to strive to have. And if we don't have a ma'asum who's available, who's accessible, then what is our responsibility? Is it to just say, let's forget the whole deal? Or is it for us to say that, well, who is the next most qualified, just, capable person who can establish salah and establish zakah? As the verses say. You see how beautiful the theory of Islamic government is. That it teaches us that there's something better than that you know, those so-called human beings who occupy the positions of power and authority, but we know are filled with all sorts of corruption and, you know, like they don't deserve that position that they're given. Islam teaches us this pure model and these pure characteristics. So, brothers and sisters, we've, unfortunately, for the most part, we've forgotten about the qualities of the leader and we've forgotten about the qualities of the people itself. Now, keeping that in mind, Let's ask this question. Why is it that our Imam has not returned? Okay, how, many, how long has it been? How many centuries has it been? Is it because there haven't been enough people who have made dua for the Imam, who have cried for the Imam, who have beat their chest for the dhulm done to his grandson, who have gone for ziyara to Karbala, who have given charity. No, we've had plenty of people do that and they continue to do that and it's absolutely necessary for them to do that as well too. But what is the fundamental problem? Why is it that this hasn't happened yet? I want to quote to you a hadith and I'm basing this points um, off of the research done by one of the leading uh, senior scholars in the Hausa today who has you know, sort of brought up these points and I'm sharing them with you tonight. There was a great scholar in Shia history by the name of Sheikh Mufid. He was one of those individuals who not only had the honor of being written to by the Imam, Ajallah Raja Hashif, but he received three letters in his lifetime. What an honor. 
Now, in one of those letters, the Imam Islam writes the following. And I'm translating. He says that if our Shia, if our Shia, may Allah give them the tawfiq to obey him, if they ha their hearts were united in fulfilling the pledge and being loyal to the covenant, this bounty would not have been delayed from them in order for them to meet us. And the good fortune would have hastened towards them when they would see us truly. And the only thing that's preventing them from receiving this is that which we see that we dislike from them. So brothers and sisters, what is that thing that's preventing the reappearance of the Imam? It's something called ijtima'ul qulub. It's the coming together of the hearts. What were the characteristics that we talked about from that verse 54 in Surah Al-Ma'idah? Adhillatin ala al-mu'minin, a'izzatin ala al-kafirin. That they have a sense of deep humbleness and love and care and togetherness with their fellow believers. So what's the problem here, brothers and sisters? The problem is the attitude that I'm going to do things alone. I'm not going to be working together to achieve the objectives of this incredible picture that God has and this incredible goal that Allah has laid out for the society to establish a society of justice. There's a beautiful tradition we have from Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. If you can say salawat, please. He explains this concept of the coming together of the hearts. He says that for the people who are the good doers, their coming together is like when raindrops fall from the sky and they go down into a stream of water that's flowing on the ground. What happens when these drops come down? Once they're there together, they all become one. They all share the same identity. They all start to go in the same direction. They all have the same goal and destination that they're moving towards. But on the other hand, he says the fujar, the sinners or the evildoers, the distancing of their hearts is like this. He gives the example. He says that imagine that you have animals on a field all together. They look like they're together. They might even be like moving together and they might be in a certain formation. You know how they have the cows when they come together, there's a certain pattern that they come together with. They come on, they come off. But the reality is that, okay, they might even be like moving at each other or scratching each other's backs, but they're not really together. They're, each one of them is doing their own thing. Right? It's like, I have my grass, you have your grass. As long as I'm accessing my grass, you're accessing your grass. You know, we're fine. What happens if the butcher comes along? All the cows are grazing, right? The butcher comes along. What are the other cows going to do? Do they care? Are they going to like protest or like, okay, let's have a, a vigil now that's sort of a blockade or... It's like, no, okay, I got my grass still, right? They're grazing. I'm... It's a very beautiful example. The Imam Islam is saying that don't be like that. He says that it's not an outer thing. It's not like just like, you know, on the outer that you're united. Right? But it's something which goes much deeper than that. You become one. You have the same identity. The meaning of wilaya in Arabic is when you have two things which are so close together that there's no barrier between them. Kind of like, you know, when you have two ropes that are intertwined with each other. They're, sometimes, like, you know, you, you use a rope. Like, let's say you're playing tug of war. You use a rope. It's actually multiple ropes that have been twined together. But you don't even think about it that way because they're so closely bound together. That's the way that mu'mineen are supposed to be like. When Imam Bakr a.s., there's somebody who comes to him and it says that there's so many mu'mineen who are ready for you to uprise and establish this goal of the just government. He says that, okay, tell me something. That is it the case, and you've heard the story, is it the case that if one of you were to go to the uh, money uh, sack of the other one and put his hand in it, that it would be totally okay? You know, think about that whole grass eating model. Is it like that or is it the other one? And he says that, no, we're not like that. Okay, like, we're ready to join you. We're not like that. 
So Imam Muslim says that no, the, 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 the companions of the Imam are going to be like that. That's the way it's going to be in that government. That type of togetherness. Now, brothers and sisters, when you look at the Shia community um, in the West, one of the problem that's plagued it and continues to plague it is this idea that we're not willing to realize that we have to come together and we need to work and have organizations and you know be part of these active movements to establish justice or what happens is that when this when they when they do get established they tend to split apart it's a huge problem i'm talking i'm speaking from the experience of having the honor to work in islamic it was part of an islamic organization for the last number of years and because i see and I've seen firsthand the incredible value of being able to work with mu'mineen. To have a common agenda, to be working in this type of wilayat model where we're so close together, we have the same cause. I feel it's necessary for us to go through some of those principles that we have of how can we actually work together in a way which is successful. You see, Muharram is not just, just about, you know, talking about the historical past. That's very important, and we do that. It's necessary. But we have to identify those issues which really are plaguing us. This is something which is a serious problem. We, we have a major issue. The biggest bala of all is the absence of the imam. This is what the, the letter of the imam says. Definitely we can say that we're lacking that. If you wanted to characterize us, are we in the example of the field or are we in the example of the stream that's flowing? You can, if I take a survey, I'm sure most of you would agree with me that we're more like the people who are on the field. So what are some of the things that we can do? I, I want to just mention some of the, the important principles that we have. Now you could call these principles for activism. You could call them principles for establishing the just system of wilaya. Or we could look at it and say that what are those things that we need to do in order to bring about the coming of the Imam of our time, Ajallah Farshah Sharif. Inshallah, if you can help me with the salawat on Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. I'll just mention a few of those principles before then we move on to the next part of the program. One of them, brothers and sisters, is the principle of Basira. Uh, basira is something which means. Uh, being able to see things clearly, to have insight, to have vision. You know, we have a lot of people who um, are doing things in the name of Islam. We have a lot of projects, we have a lot of initiatives, we have a lot of centers, we have a lot of buildings, and may Allah reward all those people who are working sincerely. But oftentimes we find that there's a lack of insight into understanding what is the priority right now. You can do a lot of things in the name of, for example, Imam Hussein salam, and many of them are good. But what is it that's really going to fulfill his mission when he's saying that Hal min mughithin yurithuna? What would really be that uh, type of help that would be a response to his call of who is it that can help us right now? For example, you know, we typically as a community we tend to prioritize those type of initiatives that cater to the needs of the people who are the organizers. But if you look and see what is the need overall in the society, you see that, okay, well, it's true that you know, we would like things in a certain way, and it's important for us to have some type of forum for being able to express those and engage with those. But we also have a very serious task of passing along the deen to the next generation. So ask yourself this question, how many programs do you know that are organized with kids being put first? No, they're really, like in terms of the timing, in terms of the way that it's organized, in terms of their participation, in terms of the space allocation. It's something that we need to think about. Why is it that if it's, at the same time, then we see that, okay, then we ask them, okay, why is it, where are they? Why don't they want to come? Okay, that's just one example, but even when it comes to the idea of what's right and what's really right to do. Um, if I can ask and request the brothers to just, um, you know, sorry for the trouble, just if you can take a step forward because there's some people who would like to sit in the back. Salatu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Thank <clears throat> you. 
So brothers and sisters, we're speaking about some of those principles that we would need to have if we want to be able to have the unification of the hearts. One of them we talked about is basira. The idea of being able to have insight and to prioritize. Imagine that you spend your whole life working on a project, dedicating your life to it, and at the end, the Ahlul Bayt is saying that, you know, thanks a lot. You know, we appreciate your efforts, but you know what? That wasn't actually useful to us. If you had only thought about it, consulted, got an expert advice on it, asked about it and said, is this really like in line with the mission? Is this really what the message was? Is this really our responsibility right now? Maybe you would have made a different choice. Okay, that's point number one. Now, each one of these, of course, we could talk about you know, at length. But I just want to kind of put it out there. Maybe some other time, somebody else, perhaps we could pick these up and discuss them in a different setting. Number two is that we need to see the activities that we do in this respect as a means to a greater end. What happens oftentimes is that when people get involved with Islamic projects, right, that becomes the whole goal itself. Um, in the words of some of the scholars, they say that what was supposed to be something that takes you closer to God becomes a source of lahu, meaning something that distracts you from God. The people who are involved with these different projects, whether it be Sunday schools or Saturday schools or charities or um, programs or mosques or whatever it is, right? we need to always be questioning ourselves that am I seeing this as a responsibility I'm performing in front of Allah or am I seeing it as something which is independent? This is very important. In the words of Ayatollah Khamenei, he says that what should be... Um, a, a means of worshipping Allah shouldn't become the thing which is worshipped itself. Number three is the importance of keeping ikhlas. Um, one of the problems and tricks the, and traps of the shaitan is that when somebody starts not only performing their personal responsibilities and trying to go on that journey, but also being part of this great journey that the society is supposed to take, shaitan gets busy and tries to change the focus and the intention behind what they do. So what does it become about? It becomes about more of how can I put on a show for the people? One of the brothers, you know, not here in a different city, just very recently, he was telling me, he was being honest with me, he says that when I first started doing Islamic work a few years ago, I saw there was a great need. They needed volunteers, they were doing great work. I knew that it was the right thing, so I, I got involved. But he was being honest, he says that at that time, I didn't care whether I got credit or not. But now I actually do care. I actually do want my name to be said. I want them to thank me. And if somebody else gets credit for my work, I kind of feel upset. And if they put blame on me for somebody else's faults, right? I try to justify what I do and I try to shift the blame to somebody else. Brothers and sisters, if it's truly the case that we're working for the sake of Allah and we're working towards that ultimate goal which is that um, system of purity and justice and wilaya, then it should be the case that the only thing that really matters, the only like that really matters is the like of Allah. What other people say, what other people do, what other people, how they judge us, even how the program turns out or how the event, whether it's successful or not, that doesn't even matter. As long as we did what the right thing was to do. Sometimes, you know, brothers and sisters throughout the world, they're doing certain things. They're not even sure whether, you know, they're going to be alive the next day. Or they're not even sure whether, who knows, it might get bombed or it might get shut down by the government because they feel that it's a threat to whatever. Right? But that's not what's important. What's important is, am I doing my duty? Am I, am I somebody who can tell Allah that I, both of those journeys were important to me? I was part of both of them. The next one is the importance of making sure that whenever we get involved with this type of so work in the society and working in, in these type of spheres, that it's always a journey for us as individuals and our individual growth as well. I was involved with one of these type of projects and there was one time when there was some disagreement among the, some of the brothers and I still remember that many years ago. And they started disagreeing and then their voice started to raise and then right in front of me, um, one of them started using foul language against the other one. And I was just thinking, I was like, what, what just, did I just hear that, I, how, how could this have happened? I talked to him afterwards, I said that, like, do you know that, like, first of all, saying foul language is haram? 
And second of all, you know, this is um, a godly cause, right? You should be able to control your anger, control your tongue, you know, see what you can do to support each other. And he admitted to me that, you know, I have this problem with my temper. I get angry when other people don't do their work. Now, it's of course important to demand and expect that other people uphold their responsibilities. But we have to see that one of the best ways that God wants us to grow as individuals is by getting close to one another. Yeah, if you're grazing on the pasture and everyone's doing their own thing, it doesn't matter what that other one does. You have your own grass. But when you're part of the same stream moving together, it does matter and it can affect you. What usually happens is that when there's some sort of like discomfort or displeasure, then we tend to kind of give up. Right? And you see that, okay, well, if that's going to be like, wait, then, you know, it's either my way or the highway. And then you see that another parallel organization is set up or like there's a break or there's a split or, you know, there's a lawsuit or whatever. What's supposed to happen is these are supposed to be the things that we work over and we work through them and we grow as people as a result. And the last suggestion that I, and the last advice that I like to convey tonight is that if we're going to be involved in these type of activities and we do need to be involved, it's extremely important. There's so many things that need to be do, done, whether it be um, in the area of education, whether it be in the area of um, social support and counseling for our community, whether it be in the area of political advocacy, whether it be in the area of youth-centered activities, whether it be in the area of hospitals, whether it be in the area of schools, there's so much work that needs to be done. But if we're going to do it, let's do it properly. Let's take it seriously. Why is it that when somebody knows that their job and their performance review depends on getting to work at a certain time, you'll find them coming early for that. But the typical attitude towards Islamic type of activities and projects is like, inshallah, you know, inshallah, I'll be there inshallah. And then that inshallah is like, you know, well, you know, maybe 50% of the time you can count on them. Right, I'll be there at this, and I'm not talking about this organization or anything like that, don't take the, just in general. You know, that, okay, we're gonna start at this time, we'll come at this time. You know, I'll be there and then I'll disappear for a couple of months and say, like, hey, where you been, brother? Assalamu alaikum, you've been a stranger. That, that's so common. Right? Why is it that we live these like weird lives where we might see each other, like for example, for 10 days in Muharram and then it's like, oh, where you been, brother? And I says, that's not the way it's supposed to be. Where is that, where is that professionalism? Where are the people who know how to manage things and organize them and set up things in a right way? These are things which can be studied. These are things which can be learned. Where are the ulama who are trained properly, who can give those real types of teachings that need to be given in order to make these projects successful? This is very important. Sometimes people think of the hausa as kind of like a dumping ground that when somebody can't do anything else, they're going to be sent to the hausa. But the hausa should be for, we should be encouraging those people who are so, have such a high level of taqwa that they're scared of going to the hausa because of the responsibility it entails. And it should be for those people, we should be encouraging those people who have the brightest potential and the most capabilities because these are the people who then can, inshallah, be a source of providing something which is really invaluable in order to make these projects successful. Not that you can't do anything without the ulama. Not that they need to be doing everything or they need to be in charge of everything. But definitely they play an invaluable role in being able to guide these projects in the right way. I hope inshallah that there are some you know, kind of overview points but I hope given the importance of this. Remember we talked about the letter of the imam. About the goal of the journey of moving this society that we can take to these heart, we can discuss them and inshallah we can act upon them as well. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Tonight, we are, inshallah, going to be benefiting from the words of remembrance and the commemoration of a very special martyr of Karbala, just as a preparing the grounds for the Masaib. One of my teachers once was mentioned a story I'd like to share with you tonight. He says that there was a majlis like this, maybe many years ago, taking place at the shrine of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas alayhi salam. And the khatib was speaking and he was telling the story of the martyrdom just like inshallah we are about to hear that story. And suddenly 
from the crowd, there was an individual who stood up. And he says that, have you ever seen somebody who is on the back of a horse, whose arms have been cut off, who has an arrow in his eye, and arrows that have pierced his chest. Have you ever wondered how such a person could fall then from his horse? And then he says that my uncle is the one who was on the horse with his hands cut off and he had to fall from that horse. And it seems that it was none other than the Imam of our time who has a special connection to Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas who wanted to remind us of his martyrdom. So on this night, we send our special salam to the Imam of our time and our apologies to him as we're going to mention these words which definitely would cause his eyes to shed with the tears of pain and the tears of agony over what took place with his martyred uncle.